Weeks and weeks ago, or years since this is being recorded in 2020, I talked about how cloud cities on Venus would be a better alternative to developing settlements on Mars. And while some people reacted as though I had just threatened their poor old grandmother at gunpoint, I quickly glossed over the reasons why Mars is probably not the greatest candidate for human occupation, at least right now. Whereas Mars's gravity is 62% that of Earth. 62% that of Earth. And I also kind of tripped over my words here. So we're going to expand upon the comments in those old Venus videos and do a deeper dive on all the things that make Mars a terrible candidate for human colonization at the moment. But first, be sure to drop a like on this video, comment below your favorite thing about Mars, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell to never miss a video. I'm Eric Malachite, author of Echoes of Olympus Mons, which takes place on Mars, and this is Science Get. In the Cloud Cities on Venus video, linked in the description, I misspoke when I said that Mars has 62% the gravity of Earth. What I meant to say was that Mars has 62% less gravity than Earth, or one-third, as one savvy YouTube commenter pointed out, which is the same thing. Getting that out of the way, it's important to note that the human body has been evolving for millions of years in our specific gravitational field. Everything from our skeletons, cardiovascular system, our brains, and even our eyeballs behave wildly different when not experiencing that gravitational force. The constant fight against gravity's pull is what has shaped our musculature. That's why when our bodies are taken out of Earth's gravitational field, our muscles begin to atrophy, sometimes even with a constant exercise regimen. The organs of the inner ear are also adversely affected, causing people who have been in zero-g for too long to experience a constant sense of distress and imbalance. The human heart doesn't fare much better with the lack of gravity either. It's a muscle, after all. People with prolonged exposure to zero-g environments can expect their hearts to become deconditioned to functioning in a normal gravitational environment, leading to extra stress being exerted on the heart during post-mission recovery. But our muscles aren't the only thing that is detrimentally affected by the effects of zero-g. The effects of low gravity can also have disastrous effects on the human skeleton. At the microscopic level, the human skeletal system is a complex and diverse system. And without the presence of Earth's gravity, human bones develop what scientists call space flight induced osteoporosis. Because almost 100% of the body's calcium stores are in the skeletal system, as an astronaut's bones waste away, that stored calcium finds its way into the cardiovascular system, causing problems ranging from constipation, renal stones, to psychotic bouts with depression. The list does not end there. Humans in zero-g environments can also experience less severe problems like falling red blood cell counts, compromised immunity, slower healing, and sleep deprivation. And though there is some research into supplements which may be able to help potential Martian settlers maintain healthy muscles, more research needs to be conducted. But Mars's low gravity isn't the only thing future settlers would have to contend with. They'll be forced to combat a world that is essentially trying to kill them, whether it's in the form of harmful radiation blasting the surface from space, impossible freezing temperatures, or poisonous regolith. Yes, that's right. The regolith on Mars is poison. Cue the title card. Perchlorates are chemical compounds which contain the perchlorate ion, right here. Here on Earth, they're typically found in commercially produced salts and tend to be used in propellants. They're also super poisonous to human beings. And guess what? Mars regolith is just chock full of them. One half a percent of all Martian regolith contains perchlorates, which while I know that it really doesn't seem all that significant, trust me, it's huge. It basically means that any astronaut sent to Mars would be hard pressed not to encounter the stuff. These chemical compounds are extremely poisonous, even in extremely low levels. And we all remember how regolith likes to stick to pretty much everything. While it is true that the perchlorates on Mars could potentially be rinsed clean from the soil, 
With these chemical compounds being so pervasive, a much more permanent and widespread solution to them would have to be developed and implemented before we can entertain the idea of making someone live in those conditions. I mean, the Apollo astronauts couldn't keep lunar regolith from sticking to their suits getting in their lungs, their eyes, and nearly every other piece of equipment they had. To add insult to injury here though, most of Mars's water is also locked away in its soil, meaning that we would need to implore mining strategies to release that hidden H2O. As if the problem of Mars being literal poison to us isn't enough, it may also be impossible to terraform it as well. Growing up in the 90s, I saw countless programs on the Science Channel and on local television boasting about the potential for terraforming Mars. These programs usually focused on the fanciful idea that we could somehow melt the ice caps of the red planet, flooding the thin atmosphere with carbon dioxide. Elon Musk has even proposed that we nuke the poles of the planet to start a runaway greenhouse effect. A seriously stupid idea. It is absolutely true that Mars has ample reserves of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, soil, and yes, at its poles. The problem is that there simply isn't enough CO2 to allow for the reaction in the atmosphere the way Musk suggested. By interpreting data from the probe sent to the Red Planet, Bruce Yarkovsky and his partner Christopher Edwards, an assistant professor of planetary science at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, found an estimate for the total amount of carbon on Mars. Yarkovsky and Edwards found that while the polar regions of the planet contain the most readily available supply of carbon dioxide, melting them, such as with Musk's supervillain plot to nuke the poles, wouldn't release enough of it into the atmosphere to really matter. They also determined that using other methods like strip mining wouldn't be feasible in the long run either. Mars also lacks a magnetosphere to protect it from the solar wind. While it's true that scientists think that the Mars of 4.2 billion years ago was much like the Earth, even featuring its own magnetosphere to protect it from the solar wind, something happened to it that killed its core and consequently its magnetosphere. Earth's magnetic field is critical to keeping the solar wind from stripping our atmosphere away and keeping harmful cosmic rays from bombarding the surface and destroying the life forms that call it home. Us. I mean us. And well, every other organism that lives here. Even if we were to entertain Elon Musk's supervillain plot, and even if it were hypothetically... <sighs> Damn it, I need to stop saying that word. Even if it were successful at producing a thicker atmosphere on Mars, without a magnetic field to protect that atmosphere, it would just be stripped from the planet by the solar wind. Though it is true that some clever scientists have proposed creating an artificial magnetic field and placing it in Mars's L1 Lagrange point. A satellite like this, which would have to be some form of reactor capable of producing a magnetic field at around 1 Gauss, would have to be at gravitational equilibrium with the suns, meaning that it would always stay between the sun and Mars. And while this technology isn't completely out of reach right now, the logistics of supplying a reactor in Mars's L1 are a bit costly to say the least. But if you thought that we were done, you're sadly mistaken because there is still a ton of ground to cover like radiation exposure, psychological issues, air supply, and everyone's favorite subject when it comes to space, cost expenditure for resupplying our hypothetical Mars colony. <sighs> and we'll be covering those in part two of our sad look at why Mars is sad and why we shouldn't go there right now. If you dug this video, be sure to drop a like on it and comment all the reasons why I'm wrong and why Mars is awesome. And be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring that bell to never miss an episode of Science Get. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time.